I'm Sydney Tetra with the Women Tech Council, and I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to have with all of these amazing leaders in technology. It's International Women's Day, and we're kicking off International Women's Month across the board. And there's this really important conversation happening around embracing equity, which is the theme for this year. One of the things we wanted to do is talk about what that meant, how we translate that into our organizations and our leadership styles, and what are those things that we can continue to do to just make our environment better. I'd love for each of you to introduce yourselves and just provide everyone with some context of who you are and what you're doing, and then we'll just jump into our conversation. Tara, you want to start? Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Tara Nujar Bryan. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Health Catalyst, and really excited to be here today to um, continue this important conversation about health equity, or health equity, <laughs> equity for women. Health equity is very much aligned with that, though. <laughs> I'm Nikki Walker. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for DOMO. Awesome. Jen? I'm Jen Gray. Um, I've spent my whole career in Utah Tech. Um, most recently, I was the SVP of Marketing and Strategy at Filevine. And I'm Anissa Brown. I'm the Executive Director for Catalyst Campus, driving innovation and collaboration for the Department of Defense. I'm Laura Butler, and I'm the Chief People Officer at Entrada. And similarly, I'm very excited about this conversation. Uh, it's incredibly important and timely. Okay, amazing powerhouse group of women that we have here today for the conversation. So Nikki, I'm going to start with you. Okay. What do you think it means for organizations to embrace equity? How do you think about that? Well, that's a big question. Um, equity looks different in a lot of different spaces, but equity essentially is the same everywhere, right? So equality says that everybody gets what they need, what they what everybody gets the same thing, but equity says everybody gets what they need. So I think that in an organization, equity is going to look different for each individual. But when you step back and see what you will see is that everyone has had a level, um, a level playing field from which to start. Hmm. Those are really good definitions for us to think about that, right? How do we create that level playing field that's right. so that we create that equity? That's right. That's and that's what we need to start with level playing field. We can't um, go into situations where women are weighed more than men or people from California have more weight than people from Florida. Mm -hmm. We need to be in a space where we're embracing everybody's differences and everybody's perspectives yep. so that we can take advantage of everybody's authenticity. Okay, love that. Love that definition. And I want to translate that now. So Tara, as you think about it, how does it translate from an organization to a person? Yeah, so I think for um, women and especially women in leadership positions, one way that translates is actually through modeling the behaviors that are essential to equity. So things like listening to your employees around what do they need from a flexibility standpoint, for childcare standpoint in particular, for women, we, we still tend to carry the biggest load of childcare. We're getting closer and the pandemic showed us some very concrete steps we can take to get closer to that. But from a leadership perspective, we need to model that, you know, hey, for example, I'm going to go to my daughter's honor roll this afternoon and we're going to need to reschedule meetings. So I think that's one big step that we can take. Um, and I think another big step is um, through elevating, making sure that we're elevating funding and giving resources to positions that are specifically designed to bring equity into organizations. And that's one that I think is starting to gain more traction and we just cannot lose that momentum right now. It's very, very important. It's interesting because of the dynamics of the economy, we have often been talking about, is that a place that we risk funding? And we can't, exactly it would take right. us backwards. Exactly right. And we really can't afford that in the environment that we're at today. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. Hey, Jen, so a question for you. When you think about ways that in your everyday work, people have done a great job at embracing equity, what does that look like? What have people done where you're like, they just did an amazing job of helping us move forward in this fashion? Mm, I love what Nikki said about it's different for everybody. And so I think the people that have really nailed this are people that are curious. Because I think understanding what someone's life experience is it's a really tough thing to kind of just look at and be like, well, I've never experienced that. So of course this person would have never experienced that. So getting really curious about other people's experiences and getting really vulnerable and raw about what your surroundings environment look like. And so, you know, looking at your calendar of how many meetings do you have that are exclusively women or only the marketing team or only the leadership team or only on-site people, I think can really create a lot of 
biases um, and I think opening your mind to be curious um, to other people's experiences and to what you may not know I think is key. That's right. It's re- it really comes down to the listening side. Oh. Right? What's, our, what's our ability to like just listen? Listening without up. getting defensive and yeah. feeling scared I think is, is, is key there as well. You have, have you ever seen anyone in one specific instance where you're like, I wish that happened all the time? You know, early in my career, um, I was the only uh, female on my team and we had an offsite and I went through and at the end of the day, I was cleaning up the coffee cups because they were all, you know, I was whatever. And um, my team member came over and he was like, would you like me to do that? And I was like, no, I can. And he was like, well, there could be some optics that we could improve if I were to do this versus you doing this. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. let's do that. And I thought it was so interesting because I, I think he understood kind of what the optics of cleaning up coffee cups were for me versus the optics of cleaning up coffee cups for him, mm-hmm. right? That's actually a really yeah, great example. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just going to add to that. I think that is a fantastic example. And also when you were talking about not just looking at um, – different diversity that you can see, but also level diversity. So Mm -hmm. one great example uh, of that 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 struck for me is I was just having a team member tell me about a meeting they were in, and they were being talked over. Uh, They were a more junior employee, and one of the more senior leaders in the room said, time out, I think they have something really important to say. And it spoke to the rest of the room like, oh, we're doing that thing where only the leaders talk and everyone else just gets to listen. And it was a really powerful moment. So I think, yeah, making sure everyone's voice is heard is also really key. I love the specific specificity of examples because sometimes we just talk about what the ideas are. Mm -hmm. And then we always have this gap for how it translates into the things that we're doing every day Mm -hmm. along the path. And I think that's really where the change happens, right? Mm -hmm. Someone steps in and says, hey, wait, I'll do this because of that. And that one thing, its ability to impact so many people is really powerful. So powerful. I think that happened like 10 years ago and it still sticks out in my mind. Like that was the example you went to. That's really, really great. Yes. Okay, so Anisa, as we think about embracing equity, we're all on this path. We're really imperfect. We don't do it right all the time. There are things that we do that we didn't know that we, you know, that sometimes happen or that create dynamics that are unexpected. When that happens... How do we recenter and reset? Like, how do you move forward from that if you're someone who has made those mistakes, or you need, or someone comes to you and says, "Hey, this happened." How do you how do you do that as we're on this journey of trying to become better? Yeah, I think it's a it's really a result of being able to articulate the direction we want to go and have that vulnerable conversation with people about is this the right direction? Do we need to pivot? And let's pivot early as a team together and understand what that means understand the expectations and keep that conversation going because it's not just one person pushing the boundaries of equity. It's everybody in the room at the table driving that. So I think it's inclusive and then also not being afraid to pivot. Do you have any examples where you've had to either provide that feedback or people have adapted and made change based on that? Yes, actually. So with the Rosie project that's launching um, next week, Identifying that there was a, a missed opportunity for military spouses to engage and be a part of the solution for the DOD. And multiple times going after that initiative and making sure that we were driving innovation and collaboration, but also bringing these underrepresented communities into the conversation, we assumed what they needed. And I think that was wrong. I think we took a step back and started actually having the conversations with military spouses to identify what were those next steps. And we pivoted appropriately, but it was always with information coming from them, not just assuming that I know what's best for everybody. Yeah, I mean, again, it's going back to, I think we have to be vulnerable enough to have hard conversations. Mm-hmm. I think it's really hard for most people to have conversations in this space. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. But I think to, to Anissa's point, um, you know, nothing about us without us. Mm-hmm. We always need to be having these conversations with the people who our impact is to affect yes. so that we understand that we are driving the right innovation, right, and the right collaboration to make the changes that are necessary in those spaces. So a lot of people are fearful about having these conversations, right? And that kind of holds people back. And sometimes I think it holds back our progress. Mm-hmm. What do you tell them? How do you tell them to like lean into that space and be willing 
to take on some of those situations. There's really no other way other than to be courageous. Like this work requires courage. And for people to not um, take that into consideration, I think is overlooking what is really happening here. There's a lot of emotional labor that goes into the work of equity. And, um, and it deserves to be said uh, because this isn't some a secret club where people are initiated, you know, in, in the dark. This is this is work that we are doing and we are transforming lives, our lives included, because of the work. We really need to understand what it takes and it takes courage. It, it takes courage to look at yourself in the mirror and to say, I have made some mistakes or I have missed these opportunities. Mm -hmm. It takes courage to reach into new organizations or into new communities and ask the questions, right? It takes courage to even ask the questions. So we have to acknowledge that and we have to move forward uh, accordingly. Courage is sometimes hard in certain circumstances for oh, people. Most, yeah. most. You know? Because courage is attached to fear. And I, I say all the time, fear is false evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. So we convince ourselves yeah. that there's evidence to the contrary, that something is so difficult or so scary or so hard when the evidence doesn't actually say that. Yep. But these are the things that we've created and like, these monsters we've created in our heads. Mm -hmm. And we've got to start to, to bring those down and to, to start rebuilding something special inside that says, no, this is the path. And we have to, you know, find the strength to follow it. You know, it's, it's interesting as you're saying that it's reminding me of an organization that I was working with that, how do you cultivate courage? And so what they did, it was a very unionized workforce and these conversations were uncomfortable and very foreign. And so they created this red program, Respect Every Day, and they had bracelets that were red, they had stickers they put on their helmets. And whenever something happened in the room that was counter to their respect everyday behaviors, they would just point, they'd like pull, they would bring it into the moment that that might not have been the best look in the moment. Because I think it kind of goes back just even like you were talking about the moment with the dishes is, you know, looking at equity in the moment. It's in the moment. It, it is how we behave moment to moment in a meeting, if we're listening to someone or not, who we're inviting in or who we're not. And I, I loved that RED program. I thought, I always think about that, respect every day. One of the hardest lessons I think I have learned is how to fight this fight for inequity without becoming the villain. Mm -hmm. When you are a victim of inequity, it is such a painful, raw experience. And that, that tends to come out when you're trying to call out mm -hmm. and be courageous. And that, that anger and that pain comes out so quickly. And I think it's become a really important lesson that as soon as you trigger someone's defense, defense mechanism, you're not making any progress for yourself or for them. Mm -hmm. And so being able to approach the conversation with sensitivity, Mm -hmm. And with empathy, that this could be a scary conversation for the recipient. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's 100% okay. But you have to be aware of sort of what your lived experience is, mm -hmm. but also how somebody could receive that. Mm -hmm. Totally. I had the opportunity the, a couple of days ago to listen to Chris Voss. Mm -hmm. the, and he talked, he talked a lot about tactical empathy mm -hmm. and negotiation mm -hmm. from this mm -hmm. FBI perspective. Mm -hmm. And he talked a lot about the fact that empathy isn't that you agree. And it's not that you even feel the, the emotion of the other person, but it's that you can meet them at their understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's how you they, they think about negotiations in really high, stressful environments. I think it applies in these same circumstances. Mm -hmm. Because being empathetic to the person across, it doesn't mean you agree with them, mm -hmm. but it means that you can meet them in order to drive change. And I think so much of it is around how you mirror people, how you talk, how you ask if this is what they intended or how you label the behavior and then your ability to really, to, and I think it takes a lot of work mm -hmm. because, so work. because it's so emotional, <laughs> right? And so every, you react with emotion versus what's my tool to help make the change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Laura, you were talking a little bit about this, about um, the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. So let's just think about this. We have a ton of amazingly talented women in technology mm -hmm. or in the various stages of the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. And this is a conversation they're thinking about or having all of the time. What are the types of things that we should be talking about or even the advice that we can give them as they're, they're driving into trying to move up the ladder and facing things and they don't want to be a villain mm -hmm. and they, they want to have the opportunity for people to respect them and move up, but they run into situations. 
Absolutely. I feel like, you know, in all the McKinsey reporting on that broken rung that just isn't changing, I feel like this is an opportunity for any female in management to really lean in and develop mentoring relationships, uh, offering to go take someone for coffee and talking about it's a non-leader and talking about how What's stopping you from becoming a leader? What are the things that are in your way? And helping grow that ambition. Because I do think that in the women that I've talked to are not very afraid of the hours of work it might take, but they're already working hard. That they're afraid of it's going to take more than this, or they're afraid of their confidence or whatever it might be. It goes to your fear acronym, really, Nikki. And I think about the, the impact it has when you really lean in and have that meaningful conversation. You're sending the elevator back down and helping women take that first leadership leap. If we could do one thing to Mm -hmm. generate more equality for women, it's helping women take that first leap into leadership. I'd like to build on that and say, we also need to hold our male counterparts accountable for also having those similar mentoring relationships. So I, I often, um, talk to my leadership team and I say like, who are you taking to lunch right now? Who is in your mentoring network? Because if they all look like you, if they talk like you, if they think like you, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So challenging and holding accountable the men in our organizations to purposefully intentionally build relationships with, with women and people of color is incredibly important to fixing the broken rung that you refer to. I do want to emphasize that I think leading with compassion is what drives a lot of individuals to pick up uh, good strategies of leading. So uh, when I worked at Hill Air Force Base, being one of the only female engineers and then on top of it, one of the only female leaders, I'm in a room where I didn't, I was the only woman there or I was one of the youngest people in the area there. But at the same time, I kept talking to my mentor who was my leader and he kept saying, you got to lead with compassion. Because if I can show compassion and I can show why I'm showing compassion to you, then others will see it and they understand it. And they know that it's it's not one person against another. It's a level ground and we're all just being compassionate leaders and taking in consideration what's happening uh, by a day-by-day basis. Not a, well, this is always happening to you. Mm-hmm. It was just very different and I loved it and I love the messaging. of Everything that I hear all of you say, it's so much about everyone's individual accountability to just care Mm -hmm. about the other person, right? Mm -hmm. Their journey is different. Their trials are different. Their place in their world, Mm -hmm. you know, however they got there, it's different than ours. Mm -hmm. But you're our, every one of our ability to just recognize how amazing all of the other people are. And I am a firm believer that in general, people are trying to do good, Mm -hmm. that they want to be good people, that they're trying to be good. And then how do we give them tools to fix what's happening along the way? Mm -hmm. I think is a big part of, some of the challenges. We do not have enough women in leadership. When you look at women in tech, the number of 5% at the executive level has never changed. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it's, and we all know mm-hmm. more women up the ladder is the only way to create dramatic cool. change. We spend so much resource, and it's amazing, and I'm so happy about how much is happening at the early stage of talent pipeline. Mm-hmm. But that run, mm-hmm. it is very broken. Mm-hmm. And that ceiling, we haven't been able to quite shatter yet. Mm-hmm. I was think, looking at the bold, there's an initiative, right? The, the, um, the bold, why am I missing the name of it? But a bold way forward, mm-hmm. which by 2030, the state would like 50% of women in tech. Okay, okay let's just think about that. It's only, only seven years. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, like, okay, yeah, we're all like, look at that. We're like, okay, it's that's why it's our bold goal. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, right. We're like at this. Yeah. But if, the, if to do that, like, this is probably one of the biggest places that we have to lean in. It's one of the biggest places, and it's actually a great point about bringing in male allies. Because of that fact, men are making the majority of these decisions, mm-hmm. on, and that networking and helping bring women through. I'm very grateful for the male leaders I've had as sponsors in my career to help bring me to the table that I might not have brought myself. And so I think that's absolutely essential. And I think that similarly, women need to see a role model in, oh, it is possible. You are a mother. You are mm-hmm. you are also working. And how are you balancing that? Because it is still, and I think the pandemic uh, enhanced this, is really a lot of responsibilities falling on women. And they're like, and being a leader too? Like, you're kidding me. And it just feels yeah. like a bridge too far. So the more that we can help with that run. Yeah, well, absolutely. Also removing barriers to entry for women. 
-hmm. So we talk about daycare. Why is that still a barrier? Yes. Why aren't we enabling women to be able to have a work-life balance and not have to worry about rushing home to make dinner? Like I, that's where I think when we talk about equity is removing those barriers of entry and making it equal for everybody to partake. Mm -hmm. Or even having equal uh, parental leave. Mm -hmm. And so it's not so gender specific, mm -hmm. removes a lot of barriers as well. And yeah. so making sure that there's this equality on the benefits field, as you were mentioning, health equality, very tied to this. Yeah. So Nikki, you've spent a lot of time too in this space, like thinking about the allyship necessary yeah. to make these changes. What thoughts do you have on, on how we fix this broken run? <laughs> I think we have to lean into male allyship. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree with that. You can always see that the voices of the oppressed aren't the voices that the lead, the leadership wants to hear, right? Mm -hmm. They need to hear from people who are in the same sandbox that they're in that there needs to be equity. So mm -hmm. we have to we have to mold our allies, just like we have to mold our leaders. Allies are people too, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't often have the language or um, they don't have the language or they don't have the strategy to move forward. They only have the desire. Mm -hmm. So it really is also up to us to educate them on how to help elevate us and how to help move us forward. Because we can't sit back and say, please help me without mm -hmm. a strategic plan in place. Mm -hmm. We need to understand what that strategy looks like just as well as they do. Mm -hmm. mm, love that idea. I'm a big believer that Lots of people are willing to open the doors, but we have to help them understand how you pull us through. That's right. And then what we do then. Right. Because it really is about the action. It's not really about just opening a door. Mm -hmm. It's about everything that has to happen to create the elevation. Absolutely. Which is the work. <laughs> right? I actually think opening the door is kind of easy. That's right. Okay. But, but once we're here, what right. is it? What, how are you going to retain us? Mm -hmm. How are you going to retain us once you bring us through the door? What are the um, potential opportunities? What are the programs? What are the what are the things that are in place to ensure our success once we get there? Yep. Yeah. And I think it, it, you know, I find myself sometimes having to even give myself these reminders of be intentional in all of my decision making mm -hmm. with my team and the people. Like I even, I have to remind myself like, oh, right, I'm so busy. I just skip over that one thing. But if I step back and I remember to say that thing or I remember to give someone that specific task or put them at the table that I was just going to say no to because I didn't have time. Like I think the amount of, like work that we have to do is actually just in the seconds it takes to help someone else in those or to educate them. Because most often it's like one minute if you just pause and you're like, hey, you should have done this. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, I totally didn't think about it. I'm going, I'm headed there. Mm -hmm. So this intentional I think, leadership, this intentional approach to equity, it, it needs everyone and it needs everyone in leadership to embrace it across the board. Well, it's an interesting thing as you kind of were opening around the investment in DE&I and ensuring that it's we've got people that are focusing on that. And in some organizations, for a lot of reasons, I know that um, you know, as people look at making sure that they're profitable, those are roles that kind of get diminished. But if it's everyone's job and there is executive sponsorship, so executives are willing to be vocal and say this is a priority, it's included in performance reviews. How are you including others, making others around you better? So your performance review isn't about being a hero. It's about how are you bringing out the best in others systematically. Also investing in partnerships. I think, you know, the Women's Tech Council has been incredible because the folks that we have involved in the Women's Tech Council do other things in the business and they're able to bring through a lot of their learnings in the operations of the business. Mm -hmm. So even without a focused role, as long as it starts at the top and it's put in the systems as part of the DNA, mm -hmm. then you still lift. Because everything we've been talking about, you know, the majority has been individual moments. And why those individual moments happened is because it was a priority. And it can be an individual priority. You can bring in an organization. But if it's an organizational priority, it's even more powerful. Everything's about systems, right? If we, we have to change the fabric of what they are in order to change the outcomes. And that's really just where we're at now. And now the responsibility is on every one of us as an individual. Because if you, if you see it and if you get exposed to it and you know, then I think you fail if you haven't taken action. Mm -hmm. so, and I think the stakes are really high. They're higher than just sort of organizations. I think we're seeing sort of 
tech talent, tech is sort of eating the world and tech talent becomes our community leaders. Like you look at Ryan Smith, Ryan owns the Utah Jazz, he owns Real Salt Lake. Like our tech leaders, the people that we promote into these leadership mm -hmm. positions shape our communities. Yeah, right. right. And so I think understanding that it's one level even obscured from, the, from mm -hmm. just our company, it's sort of what we want our world to look like and our community to look like, I think really shifts the conversation and, and creates a little bit more urgency yes. as well. Thank you. Thanks for highlighting mm -hmm. that. Because what we do today is for generations to come. Yes. And absolutely. we want the communities to thrive. Mm -hmm. We want people to thrive. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. That's why it's also so important that the conversations are happening. Mm -hmm. So that as people in those positions of power that shape things, it's doing so with the fingerprints that are important right. to, the, to the fabric of society and really the world in, at large. Yes. Mm -hmm. Leadership shapes the culture at the end yes. of the day. That's and right. that's leadership. Society, I love that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so kind of one final question for everyone. I want you to think about as we're, you know, this theme is embrace equity. We've been talking about it. What would you ask people to do in their day-to-day -day world? Because it impacts organizations, families, communities in the world. What's the thing that you would impart upon them that they should be thinking about every day for how they're going to help us make this change? Is a really deep question. It wasn't even on my list, no. but I felt like it was a really, like, that's the thing we want, right? We're all talking about it. We want people to do something. I think one of the most important things that you can do is find ways to get uncomfortable mm -hmm. and become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I really liked uh, your point, Jen, around getting curious because that's inherent in the idea of being uncomfortable, like asking hard questions, being a little bit afraid, being courageous, going somewhere you wouldn't normally go, being around people that don't look or talk or think like you. Um, I think that's incredibly important because that builds the basis then for the compassion piece and the empathy piece that we're going to need to move forward. In a similar vein, I think um, people should look at life through a lens of civility. Because when you're civil, it doesn't mean you have to agree, right? It means that you are kind enough to exchange ideas with people. And where we are right now in this space where we're looking for equity, where we're looking for some semblance of equity, <laughs> being kind enough to hear someone else's idea and having idea exchanges are high on the priority list of moving the culture forward. So exchange ideas with people, people you don't know, people you don't agree with. I think one of the things that I will just say that I, as I've watched you lead in this space that you do so brilliantly is thinking about that civility. Like you see all the things, you know, so many of the things. And I think you've also felt the emotional like weight of many of those as people have approached you in the community. And you are the epitome of someone who's willing to do that and willing to listen to those, even people you disagree with. And then find a path forward. Thank you. And I think that's the role model that we all look for in how we try to take this on. I love you. Okay. <laughs> um, Jen, thoughts? I think your surroundings shape so much of your perspectives. So I think to constantly be auditing your surroundings. Who are your go-to people as a male leader? Who do you usually soundboard things with? Who do you ask opinions for? What do your meetings look like? How many working women do you know? right? Um, do you seek out diversity in your community and in your sort of close circle? You know, I find all these, we do a lot of trainings on, you know, identifying your bias, breaking your bias. And I find that probably the best way to break your bias is to just live a different life experience and, and welcome sure. more in the, instead of getting just better at acknowledging your bias. So I think just constantly auditing your surroundings, your community, your inner circle. And, okay. So I love that. I also think that it's auditing and then being willing to listen to what they say. You're totally reminding me of this example. I have a board member, and we were having an entire discussion around not pay the pay equity side, but the benefit side, and things like um, family leave policies. Mm -hmm. And at his company, the family leave policy wasn't really great. And I started talking about how everyone was doing other things. And he had never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. right? And I said, I promise you, that's the way you keep the talent. That is, it's such a critical factor for how you create equity um, inside of those roles. And within a week, he actually went and made the change. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I heard back from other women inside of the company. And I reflected on that as, okay, it wasn't the experience that you got. You didn't even consider that previously. But because we had this active conversation, you took action. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the types of things that f they make a huge difference. 
for literally hundreds of women at that company, the world will now be different and they'll have better opportunity because of it. And because you were brave enough to raise mm -hmm. that, you know, you've become part of his cabinet now that he'll mm -hmm. consult with and talk through mm -hmm. these problems with. That's right. And I think it's a really important part. I think that's also how we build relationships. I think that's what, I mean, all of you are really good at this, but we're trying to create relationships with people in those positions so that we can create that influence. Great points. Thank yeah. you. Anisa. Yeah. Uh, no, so I think in my career, I've definitely seen a lot more reactive responses to mm -hmm. integrate, integrating crucial conversations. And I would love to see proactive uh, conversations, like really getting into the crucial conversations, not shying away from um, what makes you uncomfortable, but really driving in to change that and not just standing on the sidelines, mm -hmm. like actually getting engaged and trying to remove those barriers and push the boundaries. Okay, 100% agree. I'm always talking about that. I'm like, can everyone not be reactive? Can we just all like, take initiative? Like, I don't know what's, the, I can't see around the corners. Mm -hmm. Other people see around the corners better. Please step into those spaces. My recommendation would be to take 10 minutes every Monday for this topic. Learn about it, read an article, connect with someone, decide who you're gonna have coffee with, but every Monday, block it out, 10 minutes every Monday. Because that continuous habit starts creating just this consciousness that creates you noticing the opportunity to talk or you noticing where to connect. And just 10 minutes on Monday, that would be my recommendation. I feel like we should always let like Lara summarize because yeah. every time yeah. she's like, well, here's the exact thing you have to do, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> you're so good at that. You think about the process through and can, we have to have those habits. I love I mean, this idea of 10 minute Monday. I, I mean, even, you know, minutes. as I think about the World Economic Forum just released this phenomenal report in January. And that report is 62 pages of deliciousness, much like some of the work that uh, Women's Tech Council publishes with all these statistics that you think, I thought things were going better than this. Um, <laughs> and then you yes. read it and you think, nope, I, it recommits you, it reharnesses you. And that's the education that you bring for the week. Or you say, you know what, next week I'm going to have coffee with this person or I'm going to talk mm -hmm. with this individual. All of that planning, just 10 minutes on Monday, it will change your life. Mm. That's really great advice. And a perfect way to wrap, wrap us up, because I think the challenge that we give everyone who's listening and everyone who's participating is to be involved mm -hmm. in how we truly embrace equity and make a difference for all the generations mm -hmm. that are going to come after us and for our communities today. And the more that we do that, and the more we step into changing our habits and listening and just taking the courage to lead, the better chance we have of making a difference faster. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you for your insights and for your leadership. Like every one of you are doing amazing things. Um, and I learn something every time that we get together and I'm just honored to be able to work with all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.